Welcome to um, this evening's talk about just war. Um, I'm Edward Haddis. I'm a research fellow at the Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. I'm working with the Las Casas Institute. But I'm just here tonight to introduce um, the speaker, Frank Ledwich, and I will try to organize some questions afterwards. Um, Frank and I met at a Las Casas event and it turns out that he knows a great deal more about war than most people and has thought much more about it than most people. Um, and we've been talking together to try and combine his very deep knowledge of modern warfare. He's written um, several books about British experience in war and um, a history of just came out of history of aerial warfare. So we've tried to work together, um, combining his great knowledge with my rather modest knowledge of Catholic social teaching and the, the history and theory of just war um, to come together and have a few ideas. Those ideas have taken the form that are going to take tonight one lecture from him or discussion and next week at the same time, one from me on a more slightly more philosophical plane. But without any more, I just want to pass it over to Frank to start talking. Thanks very much, Frank. Thanks, Edward. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, and just by way of introduction, and I suppose you might say qualification, I'd like to make it clear that, that this lecture doesn't really pretend, won't, won't pretend, and won't offer a solution, needless to say, to the justice of war or, or some new. Uh, suggestions that <clears throat> um, represent any sort of philosophical innovation. Indeed, I have no expertise at all in uh, in the philosophy of war, of some familiarity with the ethics uh, from a practical perspective. Uh, and I'm certainly not, however, going to criticise those who do uh, wish to offer a solution to the justice, the questions of, of, of various questions, questions various relating to to just war. But um, I would ask for those in the just war world, and I suspect there's more than one in our little gathering this evening all over the world, at whatever time you are. It's evening here in England. I'd ask for those who, who are interested in this, in this field to, to consider uh, engaging deeply with those who are engaged in the practice of war. And that's something Edward touched on. And something I think that's perhaps lacking and I've noticed in reading deeply on ethics, military ethics, and just war theory, uh, particularly Catholic social doctrine on this, that, that there does seem to be a, a, a lack of this, of, of mingling, shall we say, between the practitioners of war and the theorists thereof. So I suppose one takeaway is from this, when we get into it, Think of talking to those people because they're very willing to talk to you. And soldiers, I was a soldier in several of the campaigns we're going to talk about. I was a reservist in um, Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq. I also served as a civilian advisor in some other campaigns, uh, all of them equally disastrous, really, Libya and um, Afghanistan. Um, and th those who, who have worked in this area of conflict are under no illusions. The older you get in this, the fewer illusions that you have. And the kind of people I think that, would, that uh, we need to engage in this, the middle ranking officers, are extremely well worthwhile engaging. And let me give you an example. So I gave a talk in Shrivenham, which is the British equivalent of Fort Leavenworth in the US, or one of the war colleges, or all of the war colleges. It's where uh, junior and more senior officers are brought to, to learn their profession more deeply and consider it for up to a year and after a talk a colonel and i fell to chatting over tea and he said to me he said you know i can't remember what the context was particularly he said a lot of people ask me and he was a colonel of infantry so he's at the front end of the of, of whatever fight it is that we, we've been in iraq afghanistan and so forth he said people ask me how many people i've killed and my answer is well, I haven't killed anybody. It's not my job to kill people. My job is to manage violence. So, and I, I've considered, I mean, perhaps you may consider it as well, 
a considered and very thoughtful perspective the management of violence and it's in essence that's what we're going to talk about now for the next half hour or so the management of violence but at the strategic level he's concerned with what we call a tactical operational level which is shootouts deployment of large numbers of troops what we're going to talk about this and what i'm going to talk about perhaps you might want to engage later is that strategic level into which the justice of war fits and i'm starting off here with uh pope saint john's famous statement from the uh, mid 60s uh, and by the way i, I, I want to say that all the good parts of this lecture come from Edward, who introduced this. Um, in 1963, he said, well, he said, I don't need to read out to you what he said there. It no longer makes sense now, in the early 60s, to maintain that war is a fit instrument to repair justice. In other words, the idea of just war is becoming obsolete. And that's, again, to many of you, not something that is new. Um, there is a requirement, as Father Rue here says, uh, he, he may even have joined us, I think he, he may be in England now, but he's, he's on the Truth Commission in Colombia, and I, I looked into some things he's written, and he said this, he says, please help us to stop this paradigm. It's time to build a new paradigm of war and just war, where um, the old ideas, which are Augustinian and Thomist, what he's considered to be, uh, can be swept away uh, after observing over the last 60 or 70 years a, a real shift in the nature of warfare. Or perhaps as Clausewitz, the famous German theorist of war, might put it, not the nature of war, for the character of war. Because the nature of war does not change. The nature of war is the killing of people, or violence, schlacht, slaughter, battle, for the purpose of power, politic, as he would call it. The character of war, he would say, is, does change. Now, air, we, we, uh, warfare is dominated by air warfare. We're moving into space as uh, uh, rather topical, actually. Uh, we're, 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 but we're also moving underwater. Submarine warfare, space warfare, air warfare is the, the, is the character of war now from a technical perspective. But the character of war has also changed in terms of its impact on non combatants more recently. To the point where the non-combatant dis distinction, which is to say the rule that professional soldiers are enjoined to com comply with, which is that we do not engage or attack non-combatants, is uh, it has eroded that rule to the point where it's almost meaningless. We're fighting now, as you'll see over the next 10 or 20 minutes, wars amongst the people. But we're also in a situation now, and I could ask you this, the, the participants this evening, or this afternoon, anyone this morning for that matter, uh, whether you consider that we, whoever we are, let's say for the purposes of, of tonight, the US, uh, Europe, and the UK, are we at war now? And the answer for all those countries is yes, we are. And I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll come to some of the granularity of that uh, soon. And you may consider that the question towards the end, the old question, just war question, one of the considerations for, for decisions to whether we, when we go in into a war, the USAD Bellin rules, that uh, we have a realistic prospect of success is no longer meaningful to the point where now one of the discussions in war studies and conflict studies is what, whether the, the term success means anything, because most people now believe that victory doesn't. And therefore, meanings have shifted and changed. This is a selection of books. I'm not going to go through them, but these, these are people who are deeply engaging with this kind of problem now. And some of their ideas are going to, you're going to see over the, uh, as, as we go on. These are people who experienced every single one of them. They're all, they're all practitioners of conflict or conflict resolution in the case of one or two. They're people for whom, for whom the sheer visceral brutality of war is something that I suppose we've all seen, but they've thought very, very deeply about it. Um, and yet, rarely in the discourse do I see reference to this kind of work. And even more rarely do the two sets of thinkers, just war theorists and these kind of practitioners, journalists, academics, soldiers, um, victims, come together. 
but we mustn't be under any illusions. It's one thing to say that things have changed, we're in a new paradigm. And I think we are uh, in the early 21st century. But we all know, and this the Las Casas Institute itself, uh, named after somebody for whom savagery was, and, and the attempts to mitigate it were, were, were just meat and bread. It's a perennial in war. Uh, just to give a few examples here, we have the Thirty Years' War, 8 million dead, proportionately speaking, the bloodiest war in Europe's history. We have Goya down there, the Spain. It's oft, sometimes you get, you get military historians or um, theorists speak about the Napoleonic period and that period just before it as a, not a, so much a golden age, but an age where combatants, you know, focuses on combatants. And this simply isn't true. Uh, the the, the, the uh, brutality of the Spanish War is something that, that's been cost some, somewhere in the region of 250,000 lives, the great majority of non-combatants. That's just one war. The third most, the third bloodiest war in human history, and in terms of um, non-combatant casualties, probably the second most uh, bloody war was that on the top right, which is contemporary to the US Civil War in China. It still resonates there. And those from Eastern Asia will know what I mean. It's the Taiping Rebellion. 20 million people killed. And then we move forward, of course, to the various devastations today. That's a picture down there, bottom right of Mosul, where somewhere between 12 and 25,000 people were killed over the last five years, almost, or most of them non-combatants. So savagery is a perennial. It's not new. You don't need me to tell you that. It's not some, the argument isn't being made this evening that savagery is new or that attacks, deliberate or otherwise, non-competence is, is a novelty it absolutely is not but there are changes today and that picture you see uh, on the uh, at the top as some of you may recognize as a rifle it's a uh, it's the most common rifle you're going to see throughout the world it's a kalashnikov in this case an ak-47 <clears throat> depending on where you go you can buy one for around a hundred dollars in a conflict zone but usually you're looking at a bit more but the power inherent in that rifle is equal to the combat power in, in the, that unit you see down there in the, in the bottom left. That's, a, that's a, a, a platoon of about 30 men from the First World War, in this case, British soldiers. The power in that rifle, the firepower, is the same or produces roughly the same as that platoon. And you can buy these rifles almost anywhere outside, outside the Western, Western world where arms are well controlled by and large some better place than other of course and the bottom right is a uh, british soldier uh, he's um, posturing as soldiers sometimes young soldiers anyone want to do uh, with all his weaponry and he can call down or uh, deploy the kind of combat power that a platoon of uh, uh, British soldiers in the First World War or the Second World War, any war really up to now, could only dream of, I mean, if, if they dream about these things. Uh, that the weaponry he has on him is, uh, has a, a vast killing power. So these, these, these shifts are, are, are very significant in deadliness. And they do render combat and conflict more deadly, but also uh, something which, in some ways, at the higher levels, more unlikely. We'll come back to that. Tax on civilians, as I've already said, were often and have often been tolerated. Uh, there's, there's nothing new in that. The tax on civilians, there we have Badahoff. Siege warfare was something which for millennia, really, you, if, you, if you found yourself in a, in a siege city, then the, rule, the laws and customs of war essentially rendered you liable to uh, whatever predations the attacking army wished to foist on you if you failed to surrender. That siege top left there is the Battle of Badajoz or Badajoz, Badajoz in Spain. Remembered in Spain, largely forgotten here, except by one regiment, the British Army, who ravaged and raped their way through the place when they took it in 1809, as I recall. And bottom right, Ypres, which was shelled to dust by the German army, uh, amongst many other towns in the First World War, along with many of its uh, inhabitants. And attacks on civilians were tolerated. They were part of war but they were not the objective of war this is one of the things that edward and i have talked about over the last year or so is they were not the object until relatively recently and we're talking now 
into the uh, sort of mid mid 20th century. So attacks were tolerated, but not the purpose of war. And that is something that is a change, and it has become ever more and far more prevalent over the last uh, uh, century or so. It was not an integral part of conflict until the Second World War. And I think our case would be that the Second World War was an inflection point, it was a tipping point where conflict shifted. For a start, and this is only one feature of, 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 of conflict, of that particular conflict, about two thirds of the 70 million casualties that we believe were killed, because no one has made an, ad, an accurate count, and no one ever will, um, because figures are not available, accurate figures in China for a start, or in the former Soviet Union. Uh, but about two thirds of the casualties in that war were non-combatant. And furthermore, many of those non-combatants were killed deliberately as part to create strategic effect. Strategic effect meaning war winning or political effect. The picture you see there, uh, is not actually Hiroshima or Nagasaki, it's Tokyo, after what is arguably the deadliest night in human history, the night of Operation Meeting House in May, March, I should say, yes, March, I think, of uh, 1945, a firebombing of Tokyo. That was a the, the objective, objective of this raid, and many others in the Second World War, was essentially to kill civilians and dislocate the systems which supported the state. So can, we are looking now at a point where the, the justice of war is becoming, is becoming something that we can question on the basis that it is directed now against non-combatants. And I won't touch on, uh, for the purposes of brevity, the various genocides, holocaust, and other slaughters that took place in that war. So mass attacks on non-combatants were considered by allies by the allies not just the germans in fact the german air force did not consider purely pragmatic reasons by the way not moral reasons uh, tax on civilians to be particularly productive but the british and uh, american air forces did and uh, behaved accordingly and this was a shift in warfare and we see since 1945, and we use this term paradigm perhaps a little too much, but examples, paradigms, the way war is, is fought have shifted again. And we're finding far fewer conventional conflicts. Uh, we're finding wars of national liberation. Uh, that the war depicted there in the uh, top left, of course, is Vietnam. And the bottom right, uh, that those are fighters in, um, in Yemen, I think. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula uh, and they bookend this period and of course it's going on and these are wars and I'm going to use this term again and again fought amongst the people in other words and often against the people in using non-combatants as a weapon and I just want to continue the thread from the start if I might uh, and, and the, the, the thread and I wouldn't call it a golden thread but the thread running through this uh, the, the argument here is that uh, uh, we're looking at a situation where ideas of just war, when you are using the people not only as a weapon but as a target, uh, are becoming increasingly frayed. And again, there's nothing new in that, in that thought. Most war studies, aficionados and enthusiasts, myself, see the 1945, the sort of liberation period, or uh, up to the end of the uh, Cold War as, as a, a discrete period, where rarely uh, did we have um, traditional conflict between armies, because traditional conflict between armies has become far more damaging, the slaughter is greater because the weaponry gets far more effective, and to some extent less attractive for states, right, because they take too much damage. And I'll come back, come back to that in a minute. The war depicted there on the left, by the way, is the Iran-Iraq war, where upwards of a million people died. Um, again, we don't know how many because neither side made a count. But it was probably the last large-scale army-on-army, peer-army peer army on army conflict that there has been, large-scale. Um, I don't count the, the two Iraq wars as a peer-on-peer peer, peer peer conflict. Casualties were essentially one-sided in that. There are other examples of the Eritrea-Ethiopian wars, 
of the 1990s where, where, where tens of thousands of soldiers were killed. So, but those wars between armies, conventional, traditional conflict has become, have become rarer and rarer. And um, uh, I, I hope it made clear why that, why that is. It simply doesn't repay armies to lay into each other in that way. Now it may well be that that may come back again. And there are those in the war studies world, strategic studies world, who believe that conventional, traditional conflict, peer-to-peer uh, -peer conflict is, is going to make a comeback. I mean, so uh, because great power conflict does loom. Um, these examples here are all in, in, involving um, uh, three or four or three, let's say, great powers. And it's questionable whether Russia is a great power. They're depicted on the right, American bombers with the Russian uh, interceptors. But China certainly is, and the United States certainly is, and there are various fracture points, which at this point, this isn't a lecture about current flashpoints, but uh, th that's it's one area where the great power conflict, where conventional peer-on-peer -peer conflict, where civilians are not necessarily used as a weapon, could loom, could loom and could happen. And you, you will know better, as well as me, or better, uh, some, some, some in the audience, uh, where, where these flashpoints take place between Taiwan, Korea, and so forth. But generally speaking, peer-to-peer, army-to-army conventional conflict has not happened over the last 30 years in, on a large scale. There are possible exceptions. Again, I'm looking at this. Now we're going to lift our eyes from conventional peer-to-peer -peer conflict to nuclear conflict. And uh, again, this, this is a very important example because it will illustrate, again, with this terrible, horrible thread of so-called just war, the poverty of thinking. On that, because uh, any um, any conflict, say for example between India and Pakistan, which is probably the most likely, with the arguable exception, Korea uh, nuclear flashpoint, will take place in a context that will involve, in a very real sense, every single one of us. Both sides there have declared hair trick in nuclear doctrines, and the operational reality there is that uh, an assumption by both sides really, nobody would expect Pakistan to invade India. But that India, for perhaps in reprisal to a terrorist atrocity, as they once or twice have threatened to do, may invade Pakistan to teach them a lesson. And that's the kind of language, by the way, that Indian senior Indian armed forces officers use. Pakistan will have to go nuclear quickly, as indeed the West envisaged it would have to do in the face of what it perceived in Europe in the 1980s to be a far superior conventional threat. Pakistan would have to go nuclear quickly. And India's response, in the words, of uh, one very senior Indian officer who uh, I spoke to about two, two and a half years ago now, uh, their response was, uh, we'll take out, if they, uh, any, any nuclear response by Pakistan, and we will, as he put it, take out Karachi. Um, so whether that's likely or not, who can say, but what we do know is that this is not a conflict which will involve only India and Pakistan. Uh, it will involve and impact very, very deeply on the rest of the world. And this is, this is a, a study of, of, of the um, consequences of an Indo-Pakistan nuclear exchange, of limited nuclear exchange, <coughs> uh, for crop yield in the Northern Hemisphere. This is not a China-US scenario, or Russia-US, or any other major nuclear power. These are two, uh, the two Southern South Asian powers and the consequences there of reduction in crop yields the following year, and of course subsequent yield years, with uh, what amounts to a nuclear winter, caused of course by the tens of thousands of tons of dust and earth lifted into the atmosphere. I, um, I've mentioned to you that conventional power conflict is unlikely, and we've, we've, had, a, a, we've had very few incidents over the last 30 years of great, of, of conventional uh, conflict, but it's now it's becoming even more, even less attractive. Caveat: potential for Indo-Pakistan or perhaps Korean conflicts becoming ever more unlikely because of the lethality deployed against armed forces by each other. I mean, for example, you see there top left are uh, autonomous envisage autonomous drones. Now, if you're, so I have many friends who are army officers, and uh, they will tell you that the survivability that they envisage on the battlefield these days is very, very limited. They do not expect to survive long. Infantry soldiers in, say, a European battlefield. And needless to say, that's something very familiar to their political and military leaders. 
And all these examples demonstrate the potency of contemporary military power, which makes peer-to-peer -peer great power conflict unlikely for the simple reason that the casualties these people will take, or we will take, are so great. Hypersonic missiles, uh, leverage, uh, leverage uh, of space power, allowing for precision, and um, uh, in the bottom right there, we have the terrible scene of the Mittler Ridge, the Basra Road, Kuwait Basra Road in 1991, resulted from a few airstrikes on retreating Iraqi soldiers. And that's what happens in the, with the kind of technology that was deployed in 1991. That kind of technology, is, you can multiply that by many times now. So the lethality of the modern battlefield renders it, I would suggest, unlikely that peer-to-peer -peer conflict is, is going to happen. But you know, this isn't a crystal ball session, and nor is it a discussion of contemporary military matters. No, what we're talking about is conflict today. And the way that conflict today has developed, and I think this is, this is something which bears especially on the just war tenets of proportionality, just cause, success, and indeed all the other criteria. This is the way that war is developing now. We have near-peer uh, operations where where various powers or middling powers let's call it deploy high technology against each other in limited contexts we have that happening today today literally today this afternoon in libya where turkey and their proxies and the uae and its proxies are fighting through and by their um, uh, various armies in the horror that Libya is 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 um, is becoming, and the, the uh, one of the decisive factors, which isn't regularly reported, partly because it's simply too dangerous for reporters, Western reporters, to go to Libya now, is the mercenary factor. Top right there, you see uh, uh, troops from a company called Wagner, and there are many more. That came from Wagner, a Russian company deploying Russian soldiers, but but for commercial uh, gain. Wagner also there in the Central African Republic and the Sahel down in the bottom right. And these groups of um, uh, proxies, militias uh, of indistinct loyalty are becoming a common feature now of conflict, particularly in Northern Africa. But also now you're seeing that or have been seeing that for a long time in Syria. So regular troops are backing off these kind of wars, which asks questions as to the role of the state. Now, I don't know the answers to that, but it asks, asks questions as to where the state sits in decision-making with respect to the justice of conflict and getting into it. Now, Las Casas himself, of course, was, to put it mildly, no stranger to ideas of war amongst the people. And uh, we are back in that domain where where, 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 where non-combatants have become at the battlefield and to a very great degree, the tools and the weapons, as well as the targets. Mm -hmm. And these wars have become increasingly fragmented in the way that they uh, proliferate, both internally, for example, Libya, and the way it has become a multi-sided war of proxies and all with indistinct aims and shadowy purpose. Those, in, those of, of you from the US or UK may have heard the term which is now very commonly used of the forever wars. These are, used to be known as the war in terror or, or the war on terror or the, um, uh, yeah, the war on terror, Iraq, Afghanistan now spread to Syria, Libya and so forth. Many military operators and military professionals don't see an end to this. They see this as, as, a, as a generational matter and it's very interesting. So I spend most of my time uh, professional time uh, teaching uh, military officers and uh, non-commissioned officers in the British Armed Forces. And it is very striking now that some of the younger ones I teach, most of the younger ones I teach actually, have no recollection of the invasion of Iraq 2003. Simply none. Why would they? They're 18 years old, 20 some of them, and they will have been two or three when that happened. The first US soldier to deploy to Afghanistan, uh, who was not born during 9-11, will be deployed within the next few months. And the 18-year-old soldiers who were um, simply not born during 9-11. So these wars are becoming generational. That's why they're being called forever wars, and no one sees an end to them. 
And if you can identify a purpose to these, because most, um, I think most, most, not all, but most sensible military strategists find difficulty doing that, then um, I'd like to hear it. But uh, there we are. That's a, perhaps a personal perspective. And what we also find, and we found this, I think, in Afghanistan, is we find existential war. War is apparently for its own sake. War for fighting for fighting's sake. Um, we're fighting, for example, in Afghanistan, there was a very good, there's a very good and sound argument to the effect that the war in Afghanistan from the British perspective and certain other European nations, not all, who were involved there, were, 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 the purpose of it was to preserve the armed forces as currently constituting, particularly the army. That's certainly the case for the British. Um, very controversial statement, but I'm not sure it's necessarily a minority view nowadays. So in other words, the, 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 the fighting there was driven by, by the necessity for the army to continue in, in its present form. In the words of one general, we need to use our battalions or we will lose them in cuts. And within these, all of these wars, whether proxy, mercenary, or, or conducted by national, national forces, uh, the, the, the killing of civilians is, is, um, is sadly uh, an integral part of it because you're working all the time amongst a non, in a non-competent environment. And that doesn't necessarily dishonor the huge majority of professional, and this is the key thing, professional soldiers who involve themselves in these wars. Because m many, very many, and you'll have seen this implied, of the, of the combatants now in these wars are not professional uh, and, and ethically driven operators. And sadly, and I, uh, this is obviously something that one could talk about for hours, there's a commercial element that the share values of, uh, of companies, as you all know, will rise at, at any, at, when, when a new conflict begins. And uh, whilst it's highly unlikely, I think, that theories concerning Iraq and oil are founded, in other words, I don't think, that what we were, I don't think, I don't think there's evidence to show that the Iraq war was caused by the desire of the West or the US or the UK to grab oil. There is evidence, I think, that oil played a major part in the, uh, in the Libya war. So, and, 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 and needless to say, arms companies are absolutely powering the disgraceful slaughter going on now in Yemen. Just to shift down now to one campaign, a well-conducted campaign, and I say that without any sense of irony, in Helmand, that's in southern Afghanistan, by professional soldiers, well-led, well, capably and professionally led by uh, professional and decent officers, commanding professional and largely decent soldiers. And these are the costs, I'm not going to go through them and read them, tens of thousands of combatant and non-combatant deaths. Equally importantly, the enduring costs of the wounded and disabled, and we haven't even spoken yet of the mental health costs, which I could easily spend many, many hours talking about. Um, refugees driven from their homes and never going back in the most appalling poverty. And all of this in a size, and this is a micro example, it's a very large place if you happen to be there, uh, of Helmand province, about the size of Northern Ireland, smaller than Wales, and with the population of Northern Ireland about 1.5 million, slightly less than that. They devastated the province and achieved, and this is the important thing from the justice element, absolutely nothing. These, let's say, existential wars where the, where the purpose is ill-defined, in fact, all wars now, I think, are lacking this definitional element of de definition, by, by definition I mean the um, uh, requirement to understand for what it is you are fighting. So the reasonable prospect of success, the traditional just war track criterion, no longer applies where you don't have a, an idea of what it is that success, what that constitutes success. So all these flags up here now are the flags of countries wherein British forces, I'm from Britain, so this is what I know, uh, are deployed now killing people and being killed, or being very few killed now, but, but certainly uh, occasionally being injured and taken home. And uh, the, the Syria, both, that's top right there. Those are, that's the Syrian resistance flag with the red stars, by the way, as you probably know. Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Mali, and Yemen. 
I'm not too sure about Somalia, but I would, would not be a bit surprised if British forces are involved there. All the other certainly British forces are involved. Now, I'd ask, I would ask the question to policymakers, would it be possible for anyone to tell us when these wars will end and for what it is we're fighting in any of those places? Only one of them has any kind of UN, um, UN uh, mandate now, and that's actually uh, the one in Mali. But again, uh, there are multiple campaigns against multiple actors uh, in a very confusing uh, combat environment where international efforts are arguably uh, not making things, uh, well, in fact, in many cases, making things far, far worse, such as in the world. And of course, these are driven by humanitarian rhetoric. There's a formal and ceremonial element that we're there to help people, of course, in many of these campaigns. In Libya, Syria, and Yemen, it's highly, uh, highly, um, uh, I, I would argue that the purpose for Western soldiers to be in these areas is, is essentially, or to a very large degree, commercial. And very many servicemen, by the way, would, would find this very, very, very uncomfortable. Libya, oil is an issue, not perhaps for the UK, but certain other Western European countries. Syria, weapons, uh, the weapons trade, proving element of, of weaponry. If you have an aircraft that has conducted airstrikes, such as a, a drone, uh, it's far easier to sell that item if it's been in combat. Same applied, by the way, in Libya. And, uh, I could give you some granularity on that. And of course, above all now, Yemen, where the, the um, priority attached in the, in the case of the UK and uh, United States to weapon sales to the regime of Saudi Arabia is what drive, what's driving much of the uh, civilian slaughter there. Whether, whether conflicts are driven by supposedly by religious, uh, uh, religious motives, of course, highly questionable, or ethnic, even more questionable, usually the power interests. And then, of course, there's a simple geopolitical purposes, such as in the Yemen, Yemen in a very, very important uh, position in the world not perhaps as important as it was in the days when the, the Suez Canal was defended by British guns. I'll move on. The response we have to this new framework, of course, is, is currently extremely inadequate, legal and ethical. We do have an existing ethical framework, the Geneva Conventions, particularly Common Article 3, because the Geneva Conventions only apply in those conventional wars, state-on-state -state wars. Uh, they don't strictly apply in non-state non activities and the additional protocol, one of the additional protocols do, does, but the Geneva Conventions don't, only one article does. And all this is in the context of wars against and amongst the people. We do have ideas of courageous restraint, those ideas are controversial in soldiers who are quite understandably make the point that we are, we are in the, yes we're in the business of managing violence, but we also have to defend ourselves. And that tension became very, very, as the recent conflicts became very, very intense. And unfortunately, reality worldwide is, it must be said, uh, prevailing over the hope enshrined in the Geneva Conventions and the various other international humanitarian, um, various other humanitarian frameworks we are finding that the way war is being conducted now is outstripping the ability of the international community, if we can call it that, to respond. So new approaches are required. Well, never again war. That's the pacifist approach, of course. It's espoused, but espoused and I'm quoting here Pope Paul VI, as I recall. Um, just war theory now, it is without question, in the words of some commentators in uh, uh, 2016 truncated and minimalist, I think that's true. Um, we do have a requirement now for scholars of war, theologians and ethicists and uh, practitioners, academics to begin to work together, perhaps outside the framework of the state to develop new ideas. And we see, by the way, this kind of new ideas developed in the cyber domain, where cyber ethicists and lawyers have accepted that states aren't going to get together and do things. So what they do, have done is they've got together and, and um, in something called the Tallinn uh, rules, they've, they've uh, developed a, a, a series of, of uh, proposals to regulate cyber war. Very sensible, well thought out by some very sensible people. 
And perhaps we need to adopt a realistic, a more realistic approach to that offered by strict pacifism. However, understand that pacifism is, is, a, is, a, is a highly compelling option, and particularly for the, uh, for the church. However, I am going to leave you now with just about yeah, 40 minutes uh, to, to my um, uh, limit here, but um, I'm going to leave you with a, with a dilemma um, for those who are um, uh, penned to the pacifist. And it'd be very interesting to hear your response. And you've all heard, this is a, a perhaps, um, the, the, there is a rhetorical question it's all put to all pacifists, isn't it? And that is, which pacifists would not defend their children if they were attacked? And to some extent, that's a very similar argument, isn't it, to, to the um, uh, uh, ticking bomb scenario in, in, um, in the torture debate. It's, it's, uh, it, 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 it raises false dichotomies to some degree. But however, I'm going to ask you this. Though. I'm going to put you in this position here um, because pacifism is very attractive. And it's all very well to say that the just war paradigm, the just war uh, framework developed over one and a half millennia, perhaps even two millennia, is, uh, is now obsolete because of the way war is going, this fragmented and inchoate uh, framework of conflict, and war and wars amongst the people. But I'm going to put you in this dilemma now, which isn't a, which isn't a, a ticking bomb of would you defend your children? It's this. So here you are, and I'm going to give you, show you a, a, a very short video. Um, I'm not one for giving trigger warnings. There are, there's no blood or, or, or mayhem, blood or carnage on this. There's a little bit of mayhem. What you're seeing there, what you'll see in a minute, is a dilemma faced by one of my students who was guiding the missile on this attack here. And what's happening is that that uh, angle is a, uh, is a, uh, you see here is the top of a building. Uh, here is a crowd, and you're in a drone. You're in a drone, and the drone has to make a decision. And this is a decision for those who are flying it, not their commanders now, because they have the last word as to what to do next. And what, because what's going to happen now is, is, you will see two men walk to this corner. They will give a speech, and what they're going to do then is they're going to bring out somebody else. And they're going to kill him, and this is Islamic State in Raqqa in 2016, just before they were uh, defeated. And they have forced hundreds of people to gather and watch this. So the team have to decide, A, are we going to do this? B, will the missile that we fire, that we're going to aim at, at the apex of that building where these two guys will go, will that missile fly over the parapet and kill some in the crowd? These are RAF crew people. Their orders are zero civilian casualties. What do they do? Hopefully, you will see. My student related to me this, we watched this in real time as they made the decision. They have to make a decision in seconds. They make the decision, the decision is to fire. And the missile now is on its way. You see those two guys there at the apex. And what they, they do, what happens then is the crowd disperses. And the man who is about to be executed is saved or killed, murdered, not executed. And there's also an informational aspect to that too. So um, I would ask you, would you have taken that shot? And if not, why not? Okay, that's it from me. Um, I wish you all the best and I look forward to your questions or especially really comments. Okay, thank you, Frank. That was really excellent, um, if I may say so. Um, and um, we have one question that's been written in. I think there's capacity to raise hands and so forth here, but um, let me just read the, the first question that someone has asked which is um, from Colette Joyce, it says, um, wh where does the role of justice come in as a military option for managing, determining whether to engage or not in conflict? Um, maybe you, you've spoken of just war, so maybe talk about what, what, what you think how justice is a criteria in managing 
and can I ask other people to please write questions and or or um, get get involved here? I'm very interested. We we want to have some lively things. Well, I'd, I'd like to answer that or start that by coming down to the tactical level, which is the level at which soldiers operate, or most soldiers operate. So let's take that last short video as an example. Um, of course, one, one could ask what, what one means by justice. Your justice might be my, my uh, atrocity. Um, but the soldiers who, or airmen who fired that shot, it was their choice to do it and take that risk. Um, they would say that absolutely they were motivated by justice. Now, that's at the sort of colloquial, personal level. We see, however, so that's at the that's at the tactical level, and time and time and time again, you hear soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, indeed civilians, talk about what's right and what's wrong. It's right what we did. We did our best. We couldn't have done any more. And they will talk about the atrocities committed by the enemy and whatnot. Um, but at the higher levels of state. We see that narrative deployed time and again, don't we? And the most compelling example of that is humanitarian intervention, where it is right, is it not? It is right and just that we use our, our, the force that we have at our, finger, at, our, at, our, at our disposal to intervene on behalf of those who are at risk of uh, being killed or, uh, or yeah, being killed, or indeed, in some cases, driven out of their homes and sometimes in reprisal. And the trouble is that's, of course, a siren, almost literally a siren call. It's a call leading us to the rocks because not a single humanitarian intervention over the last 20 years, arguably, not, ex not excluding Kosovo in 1999, has turned out to produce a just, I would suggest to you, a just outcome. Libya did not. You could, I could talk in, in detail about Libya or Kosovo. I would suggest the production of a, of a, um, a criminal narco state in the centre of Europe, where one portion of a community, namely 10% of it, is marginalised and victimised, is not a just outcome. Uh, I'm not a philosopher, so teleologies and uh, purposes I'm, I'm not equipped to talk about. But from the empirical perspective, when I hear politicians or generals talk about it's right to do this or it's just and I start looking for other reasons very quickly and also one uh, uh, as Clausewitz said war is the province of friction and friction means some things that you can't predict it's millions of moving parts the cumulative impact of which cannot be effectively cannot be uh, be foreseen and that's why humanitarian interventions over the last 30 years, driven by ideas of justice, have largely failed. There is one exception, which is Bosnia in 1996. That's a very, um, it was a very limited operation. So it's such a huge question, or such a huge point, where does justice fit in? And if the question would like to, 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 to come back on that, or perhaps um, narrow down what she means or he means about it, then that would be good. Uh, but uh, those are the words that come to my mind. There's a, the sort of personal elements of justice, but also the uh, more strategic elements. And it's a siren call, I think, when, when, the, when the consequence, of course, is the deaths, the disabilities of uh, thousands of people and uh, the ruination of, uh, of, of what might be a stable but highly unsatisfactory affairs, but at least a stable set of affairs. And that's where last resort, of course, comes in. We don't. We simply the last resort argument, to me, to my mind, by the way, just simply doesn't doesn't isn't addressed anymore. Okay. We have the ability to do something, therefore we do it. There's a determinist aspect to contemporary strategy. I think it's extremely distressing. It's a very bad uh, bad development over the last twenty years. Anyway, I'm just babbling now. So I'm, I'm uh, well, we've got some more good. We've got some very good questions here. Um, um, one one of which the the first one is is. Um, you refer to conflicts between states, but often the just war paradigm is used in relation to liberation struggles. For example, the violence used in South Africa. Do you have any uh, comment on 
liberation struggles and whether there's some more justice in that kind of violence. Well, I, to be candid with you, it certainly appeals to me. Um, well, you know, speaking personally, my, my grandfather was in the IRA uh, in the 1920s, I hasten to add. Um, my wife's grandfather was a partisan in the Albanian hills during the Nazi occupation. Um, it's very appealing. And the question, of course, is, is, is much the same as any other question concerning the rectitude of conflict and the justice thereof is what what is your outcome and we see liberation struggles again producing variable outcomes you mentioned south africa well it's very hard to, it's very difficult to argue that is not a just struggle but but it's a it's an exceptional struggle i, I challenge anyone to come up with others and I've seen, I've seen now five, five at, 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 at very close quarters. One, Bosnia, unless uh, Bosnia, Kosovo, certainly, certainly Libya, um, Afghanistan, arguably, Ethiopia, Ireland, arguably. Um, I, I, the, the, the ways those conflicts were conducted uh, were were unjust, I'd suggest, and the outcome certainly unjust. So um, there seems to be a danger here of, of rhetoric of justice ending up not serving justice, and that that would probably extend to liberation struggles also to some extent. Yeah, I mean, but uh, but then one doesn't one also have to to take into account, to be fair, the question of last resort. In the apartheid struggle, that was a last resort. They, 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 everything else was tried, and the international community, such as if you can call it that, wasn't really willing to wasn't willing really to put put the requisite pressure on South African government until far too late. But but then one has to ask: Was it the liberate, Was it the armed struggle that brought South Africa, the white South African government, to its knees in the end? Maybe it wasn't. I'm not really equipped to say. It's a long time ago, and I never studied it closely. Good. But actually, I, but one hesitates, doesn't one, at liberation struggles, because now liberation struggles are all too often intended to draw in outside powers, <clears throat> and the drawing in of which produces chaos. The Libyan, that's not wrong, the Syrian case, of course, is the most egregious at the moment, where the Syrian, democratic Syrian resistance at the start was in it, was an was a entirely just cause. Um, they took up arms quickly. But we see how that devolved. They were fighting an extremely ruthless, vicious regime who, uh, who uh, almost immediately freed every jihadist they could find in their jails in order to turn the revolution inside out, which is what they did to produce half a million dead and shattered polity. So liberation struggles such as South Africa, yes, but that's an ex post facto judgment, I suppose. And it's questionable whether that the armed struggle produced the effect that it did. But I'm, I, I, I'm finding it difficult to see um, any other liberation struggles that have worked in that way. And of course, recent studies have shown that it's nonviolent action that produces effect. I didn't touch on nonviolence at all. That's, it's not my field, but I, uh, the, 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 I mean, some very, very compelling studies. And one need, doesn't need to read very far in Pax Christie documents to see that. It's nonviolent struggle internally that produces results in the end. But I'm, I'm very willing to discuss that. With people who know more about it. Um, so another question from another slightly different angle, um, which is on the conventions of war. Um, the question is asked is, is it the case that if we create new, more comprehensive conventions in the Geneva current Geneva Convention, that states would just go to ever more devious lengths to get around these conventions? Yeah, I think that's a real problem, isn't it? That uh, you I remember when I was being trained, my, my trade was as a was as an intelligence officer and one of the trades we have is interrogation and this is in the early 90s um, when we were told you know here's the Geneva Convention the Geneva Convention on prisons of war learn it inside out know the detail I want you to know all the details why so that we can find ways to get around it um, it was only applicable we, in those days we were thinking we were going to be fighting the Russians and what have you um, 
obviously things change later. But there is that tendency of states to, to look for exceptions rather than uh, exceptions in the um, in the letter rather than uh, to study the the, the spirit. Um, the, the 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 issue though about new conventions is stymied by the high, highly unlikely, or, or rather the international situation as it is, where states are very unlikely to get to states are very unlikely to get together to produce these conventions. What you're going to have instead are very powerful and competent and capable NGOs, such as the Roman Catholic Church or the International Committee of the Red Cross. And please forgive the the uh, uh, terminology. I think you know what I mean. Non-state actors, let's put it that way, who will be developing um, and should develop. And this, I suppose, is, is is the polemic point being made. Should be developing new norms. The ICRC certainly are of how moving away from the just war paradigm, the ICRC have, are certainly doing that. You also see that, as I mentioned, in the cyber realm, where scholars have decided, you know what, states aren't going to do it, so we need to. We need to develop what's called a, 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 a um, opinio juris uh, in, in, in the international uh, humanitarian, well, international law world. Opinio juris is the sort of consensus of those who practice. And that's where, this, this, that's where development should take place. Um, but yeah, to answer the question directly, without question that's what people do you know, they, they look for exceptions okay um here's a question that i think a lot of people might ask in a slightly different way but the, the way it's asked here is is there a lack of political will to win wars because of public images and views so countries don't want to commit enough troops spend enough money after the initial conflict to have a lasting resolution um and then the sort of sub question here is, could that be just because military contractors actually prefer long indiscriminate wars to, uh, to uh, the actual resolution? Can, can wars really be won in, in, in the sense of- Yeah, there's a, the, th thanks Edward. The, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of discussion now, as you probably, as I, many people will know listening to this, as to what can, constitutes success and victory, whether there is victory now in war. And the question directly was, well, is it because states, and let's say the Americans and the British, in the case of Afghanistan or Iraq, haven't committed sufficiently? And I'd suggest in those cases, no. The, 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 we're looking at an expenditure for Iraq now, north, somewhere north of $4 trillion. And uh, 4,500 American dead soldiers, 100,000 wounded, tens, hundreds of thousands, thousands more. The commitment has been very, very great. Afghanistan, slightly less in terms of, uh, we're looking now at somewhere between one and two trillion, about 1,500 American soldiers, another six or 700 NATO soldiers killed, uh, all of it wasted, of course, in my opinion, um, could discuss that. So the commitment was there now, but, and this is the issue, the strategic will, which I think is behind the, behind the issue behind the question, whilst the financial and personal commitment may have been there for the time that those wars took took place or, or are taking place that was there but what wasn't there was the strategic patience that some would say may have produced these wars were never going to be won but there might have been something like success we might have had a democratic and prosperous iraq which should be done but this should be prosperous we might have had uh, an afghanistan that worked at a low level of effectiveness, which was, I think, as, as, uh, instead of the failed state narco vertically orientated criminal syndicate that it is, um, might have worked somehow as a federal state. But nobody defined any kind of strategic path to that. And nobody had agreed on a strategic path to that. So what was the point of strategic patience of staying there 10, 20, 30, 50 years if you had no idea of what what the path you were on looked like so instead the idea was well we'll search for 18 months and see what happens and what was going to happen was a lot more people were going to get killed uh, the, the way that political cycles in the west work work of course the reality is they don't engender strategic patience which leads back of course to the question well in, in what for what reason then are you involved in these campaigns if you're not willing to finish them again that's implicit in the question my answer would be because people didn't think them through, think any of this through. 
including me, by the way. Yeah, I, I was not involved in the decision making, certainly involved in the execution, and I wasn't complaining about it, at least in the early days. So I'm as guilty as anyone else for that. Uh, um, your the humility there is, is, is admirable, really. Um, but well justified humility. <laughs> um, the, a question from someone you hint at, but did not completely mention that the mercenaries are, are an underworld, as um, and this chap, uh, this is William Kenny, says, I have met the same people fighting in Lebanon, Bosnia, and East Timor. Yeah. They're used by what we might call respectable combatants. The same so they what by? Used by. Oh, yes. Yeah. The same space is occupied by illegal sellers of arms. Why do these groups um, and others operate seemingly without any real restraint? Is it just business or is there some politics that allows them to be outside of any ethical framework? Well, no ethical framework or no legal framework uh, has been developed which will allow enforcement extranationally. You do get the occasional exception, such as the Blackwater case, which I think Mr. Kenny will, will know about, where uh, uh, there were um, convictions of characters who, 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 who murdered Iraqi civilians, but they're very few and far between. The Americans, until Americans actually uh, uh, try and negotiate a, a system whereby uh, prosecutions are discouraged in the, at the political level of of their personnel. However, the regulation applied to American and British private military contractors, as they insist on being called, and I've met, like Mr. Kenny, many of these people, and some of them I, I, I occasionally correspond with, and I, I quite like the ex-British soldiers who frankly find themselves in a situation where it's a good way to make money. But the fact is that what they are are mercenaries. They, there is some regulation applied to them that one relies to the extent that there's any behavior, behavioral norm on their profession, professional ethics derived from their professional service, which is often quite high, actually. Not always, as we see with uh, Blackwater. However, the bulk of mercenaries now deployed are not, as Mr. Kenny will have seen, um, from the United States, France, or Britain, or like countries, they are uh, deployed by uh, companies with perhaps no uh, address. The most interesting examples, let's put it that way, which perhaps we'll discuss some other time, are well, there's twofold. There are the Colombian mercenaries deployed by the UAE into Yemen, uh, 450, a whole battalion worth of Colombian fighters, combat experience. And there are the 1,200 Wagner mercenaries, which are basically Russian infantry in uh, Libya, who were withdrawn on, I think, last Wednesday with strategic effect, and they very much reduced General Haftar's combat power. They are essentially acting, of course, explicitly as proxies for states. But without the limited handle that the Russians might have on their own troops or limited accountability that they might apply, flowing both ways they are loose cannons i believe in central african republic russian mercenaries are highly uh, um, i nearly said effective but they're very uh, commonly seen and the issue is uh, accountability now the way around that of course is for states to take hold of of their citizens and their companies and regulate them properly and there are has been moves have been moves to do that particularly after some of the scandals in the west concerning west african mercenary british mercenaries in west africa but nothing's come of it really it is a chaotic world and there are some some theories today i mean i i'd urge I urge uh, those who are interested in this to read an excellent book by a fellow called Sean McFate called Goliath and it was there on one of the slides and he sees mercenary warfare but regulated mercenary warfare as the future. He's, you know, he sees, the, he sees the, the pattern of the French Foreign Legion or the British Gurkhas, both of whom would, would put it mildly severely objective and call mercenaries, but let's say foreign um, employed soldiers under, under proper regulation as the future warfare. Quite bluntly, he was a mercenary himself, as he puts it. <laughs>
and he's a highly respected academic and he's but he sees the way war is developing as moving away from regular regular deployed armed forces to the extent that they are accountable into that into that pattern making in other words bringing bringing um, uh, the law if you can put it like that moving that towards reality rather than the other way around trying to pull it in he says that's that's a high you're on hiding to nothing he says with that um, so that that's the way war is now that is a depressing thought. Um, here's a, a question from, from Sam Burke, um, one of the Dominican brothers. Um, do you believe that the presence of a strong military can prevent war? Um, where, does, where does your discussion leave military spending as a, as a political or a, an idea? Is it, does it, can, can strength bring peace? The danger of having strong, large militaries is that lo strong, large militaries are led by people who like to use their strong, large militaries. And there's a determinist factor in that. The, key, the, the example I'd like to bring forward in discussing is the British strategy at the moment. So our, our military strategy is based around an idea called expeditionary warfare. And no one in the UK, or in fact, for that matter, in the US, will have missed the importance uh, to the presentation of our militaries of aircraft carriers. Now, in the British case, we can neither deploy nor protect nor man these aircraft carriers. Well, they'll be, they'll be um, um, to a very great degree manned by US assets. Anyhow, the point I'm making is that our relatively strong military is based around, armed around, funded around the idea of expeditionary warfare, which some may translate as the idea that we can invade other countries, should they mostly, of course, Muslim countries. Uh, in fact, almost all of them in Muslim countries since 1999, uh, when we take it in our, into our head that an expedition is worthwhile fighting against them. The British armed forces are not capable of fighting China or a peer competitor at the moment on their own. So there is, there is that determinist aspect which is dictated by the highest levels of national strategy. So our forces are designed to move, work and fight overseas at, at distance, and they're very proud of that. It's called having reach. The other approach, which I prefer for what it's worth, is that which was articulated extremely well. I was quite surprised that I thought, well, this is what I think, by an Irish army officer. I, I, every year I'm very privileged to be asked to go and speak at the Irish Defence College or, or Command and Staff course, where some very highly com combat experienced soldiers whose combat experience is gained entirely in the context of the United Nations approved operations. He said, he said, he said, isn't it about time that we, or words to this effect, isn't it about time that we thought of defence forces as defence forces? And that the ministries of defence of the countries of the West return to that advertised role. In other words, that we should see, see, see our armed forces for that purpose. So there might be a distinction to be drawn then to answer uh, Father's question between strong armed forces geared for expeditionary warfare and strong armed forces that are explicitly and exclusively designed for defense and that's what we don't have now but uh, in fact frankly british armed forces are our defense forces we have no air defense system in this country except a few fighter jets so, so we are not designed to defend our shores or indeed the shores or borders of europe and can't do so at the moment but we are designed and configured to send aircraft carriers and marines 6,000 miles away to deal with uh, activities we don't approve of. And uh, therefore, that's what we're likely to do. Right. Um, the tools determine the, the yeah. use there. Um, a, a couple of questions I'm going to combine because we're running towards the end of time. Um, one is um, that can, is, is, is there a just war defense for defending yourself, your territory against an aggressor? And the other is a broader question, but along the same lines, is there ever a way in which war can bring justice? Well, that, that, I suppose both of those questions are a matter of considered opinion. And concerning the first question, self-defense, self-defense is the only explicitly authorized justification for the use of force throughout any just war system, including the United Nations, where it's explicitly stated as a, as a adequate reason for the deployment of force, and including anticipatory self-defense, which means you can attack someone if you know they're going to attack you. I, I believe that to be, I believe that to be 
cogent and, and, and sound. I mean, after all, I left you with that thought, I suppose, of, well, what, what would you do if your children or your close friends were under attack? Were you, were you a pacifist? And I, for what it's worth, I, I tend to the pacifist. And the answer is clear. I think we would all act to defend them, perhaps passively, perhaps actively. As for the, so that's, a, 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 that's the perspective I take. And I suppose when translated into defence policy, that's what the Irish soldier was talking about. We should configure our armed forces for that purpose. And I think that's a very wise way of looking at things. And as for whether war can achieve just purpose, I suppose it could, but I've, I've not seen it recently. I thought, I mean, my, my, my own trajectory for us worth unconscious of time is Bosnia. I spent two years in Bosnia looking for war criminals and things like that. Very, very satisfying. But it was not a war, it was a peacekeeping mission. Kosovo, well, I, one thought that was a just war and it turned out not to be. Afghanistan, Iraq, goes without saying. And then, you know, I thought, well, perhaps, perhaps Libya looks good, only to find. So. I suppose that's an answer founded on empiricism. And there's a question here from Colette. What if you, I did, it's gone now, what did it say, Edward? What if you have greater firepower than the person who is intending to attack you? Is proportionate response possible? Uh, well, in the words of one uh, commander of the SAS, who um, I knew to know quite well, he said, if you find yourself in an equal fight, uh, you've done something wrong. Um, and if if you are punching above your weight, you're in the wrong fight. So um, I think to, to to be less flippant, the the I think a really good example of this, where where force in my belief was deployed justly on that basis that Colette was hinting at, was Bosnia in 1995. Srebrenica had just happened. There were likely to be more. The situation was chaotic. Uh, and NATO, in a period of a week or 10 days, deployed huge firepower against an inferior opponent to achieve what I think even now one can see as a just outcome. Um, and that depends on whether, of course, you have a just cause in the first place to a great degree, because we did the same to the Iraqis for no just cause. But as an example of the deployment of overwhelming firepower against the inferior opponent for the achievement of a just cause in an unlimited strategic context, Bosnia, I think, is the last time that happened. Okay, I'm going to ask one final question, but as we're the, the stated time was 7.15 London time, and I'm, I'm going to stop it. But before I ask the question, I just want to remind everyone there's another talk that I'm going to give next week. It will not be nearly as interesting but uh, as Frank's, but I will do my best. It <laughs> is standard um, and it will be a little bit more philosophical about um, what war really is and what we've learned from all the things that, that Frank has talked about about the nature of modern war um, maybe that will teach us something about how to think about war in general um, there's also a request um, from someone to have a little reading list um, af after this so um, maybe we'll ask Frank to put something on the website yeah with pleasure recorded so it can be shared i mean assuming the recording works my last question to you then um and we'll make we'll close it with this is one of the things i've noticed in, in these answers is that there are very few examples of things that we feel well that really worked that was just that was good and they seem to be a bit of a cover for a lot of behavior that's not just we say well look it worked in bosnia we should do x again do you think that there's a kind of bad lesson that gets learnt from the rare successes that we can cite in, in war, that we, we want to generalize to make them, them more common? A bad lesson. Yeah. What bad lesson have we learned? Yeah. Whether well, we learn, we, we tend to think or we claim yeah. war can be just because we can find some examples. Um, well, I suppose we, we, what we should have learned is that the possession of excessive force and the tactical success obtained by the deployment thereof is uh, independent of the justice of your cause, which needs to be defined before 
which needs to be conditioned to a, having a, a realistic path beyond the use of that force. In other words, this is just strategy, basic strategy, and a, a full understanding of the costs and time it's going to take. And time and again, you see senior military, I mean, the best example is Libya, where I think, to be fair, many military officers had learned the lesson, the lesson of Afghanistan, but politicians hadn't. So that what happened there was that, in, and by way of anecdote, a very brief one, is that the prime minister ordered his chief of the defense staff, General Richards, a very fine person, I met several times, to uh, uh, keep his mouth shut because General Richards was rightly pointing out that we need a plan for afterwards and we might need to consider what we're going to need to deploy and for how long and that we might not have the resources to do that. We should think about that before we really start doing it. He was told, you do the fighting and I'll do the talking, words strongly to that effect. So I think, I think a lot of very senior military officers, particularly those who've been through Iraq, Afghanistan, and to a lesser extent Libya, are cons very, will consider this kind of stuff very, very uh, deep, deeply nowadays in the West, you know, the Western Europe and, and North America. And we've got some very good military leaders uh, scattered about. We've also got others who consider armed forces something that needs to be used, which is the other. Right. So perhaps if you want to, you can learn the right lesson. But if you're a politician, you don't necessarily want to learn. Well, yeah, because po 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 you know, po they have so little, it's, it's not that they're malicious or maleficent in any way. Or they, they, they don't have the experience. I mean, Cameron had never been involved in that kind of operation, either at the political or a tactical level. Um, and, and he was drawing on, on, on literally no experience, which is not something, but not a problem that beset you know, the, the, the politicians of the 80s, 70s, or 60s, for obvious reasons, or even the 90s to a lesser extent. Good. Okay. Um, thanks very much. I thank you all who are still here with me, with us. Um, I thought that was a great presentation, Frank, and um, we'll call it a, an evening now. Thanks very much. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thanks, everyone.